Oh my goodness. Technical difficulties. All right. Can you guys hear me? I don't know what's going on. Okay, cool. Perfect. Welcome to our May installment oh, of my goodness. Technical difficulties. All right. Okay. It's like muting, unmuting game here. All right, to figure out how to get it all work together and not talk over myself. Okay, today we're doing Alice in Wonderland. I cannot wait to discuss this iconic book with you. I just felt like everyone loves Alice in Wonderland, but nobody has read it. <laughs> and I know some of you have because you are just amazing, incredible readers. But I didn't know anyone who'd read it, but I feel like everyone loves it. And when I, you know, somebody would say, oh, I love all things Alice in Wonderland. And I was like, oh, have you read the book? I have it, but I haven't read it. And then everybody would be like, no. So I, just being a Disney fan, wanted to put it on the list. I knew it was gonna be a bit of a challenge, but I hope that you were able to stick with it. And I'm so excited to discuss it tonight. I am getting over strep throat. So if I sound a little weird and I look a little messy, it's just because I, I've been down for the count for about two weeks, so I feel like my voice sounds crazy, but it's a little better uh, than it has been. So anywho, that's what's up over here in Glam HQ. We're gonna go ahead and get this party started. We have a little bit of a smaller group. I think we just lost Sarah due to some technical difficulties, but she should be back with us. And we're gonna start with who is your favorite bookstagrammer? We, the past couple months, have kind of been sharing our favorite bloggers and our favorite, um, you know, uh, booktubers and stuff. So I thought it'd be fun to go through inspiring Instagram accounts. So I have to give our Instagram a little plug. If you are not following, I would love to hang out with you on Instagram. And I'll just close out of it. Here we go. So we have an Instagram. It's at Paper and Glam Instagram. I don't update it as much as I would like to, but it's got some pretty pretty fun pictures. And I also want to share with you guys some of my favorite Instagrams. So while I get that pulled up or bookstagrams, I guess, as the appropriate term would be, Tabitha, do you have any favorite Instagrams to share with us? Um, I do not. It's so funny. I was like, I don't even know what a bookstagram is. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I could share with you I mean because I only use my Instagram for all things Barbie so um, but there is a booktuber that I like Ariel Bissett I think I'm saying her name correctly but I love her enthusiasm and passion for books so I'm usually on YouTube much much more than I am Instagram Okay, um, I might sound weird because I don't think I'm getting strep and I think I'm getting something. So if I sound weird, that's why. Um, <clears throat> my favorite Instagram is not so much for the pictures necessarily, but because we have similar, I think, um, and that is Annie B. Jones. Um, that's the Instagram name. Um, she is the owner of the bookshelf in Thomasville, Georgia, and she's um, she does book reviews for all the books that she reads on her stories and, you know, tells her rating of it and stuff. And we tend to have similar tastes. So I, um, if I'm looking for something that maybe is new or um, coming out soon, that's who I go to um, for some recommendations. I'm going to plug our very own Erica Covey because she is my favorite bookstagrammer because she is who I go to. To look and see what she's reading because we have similar taste in books and then I always see what she likes and what she's been up to so it's always fun to see erica's instagram feed and see what she's reading i love erica's too hayden <laughs> awesome um i also love um one that's really aesthetically pleasing that i really enjoy is uh, blue stocking bookshelf uh that's a really good one um i also like uh obviously the what should I read next in the modern Miss Darcy? Uh, that's a good one. And also I really like um, the Reese Witherspoon one. She's, it's called Reese's Books Club, Book Club and Hellish Sunshine. Um, that's a really good one as well. And Sarah is back. <laughs> we were just doing the icebreaker. So we went full circle. Do you want to share any of your favorite Instagrammers or do you need a second to regroup? <laughs> Um, I actually, you know what? I don't follow a lot of bookstagrammers. I follow so many um, food <laughs> bloggers. It's insane, which my favorite food blogger ever, I just have to shout out, is Olive an Artisan. She's so funny and just like a genuine person. 
Um, but I think I follow Book Sugar. Does she count as a bookstagrammer? And that was the one that I have pulled up. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Like and now I, I have to find another one. Keep talking. <laughs> yeah, she. I love her style, the shots. Um, and I feel like I follow some. It's like between the leaves. There's some underscores in there, and she does reviews. Um, and she's like, she uh, reads like Erica, like just every other day. I swear is a new book, so. Um, I get a lot of recommendations from that. That's kind of, that's all that's coming to mind. I will plug, I kind of wanted it to be like an individual, but um, one that I'm really enjoying is the Penguin Classics Instagram. And what I like about it is it's all like their new editions of classic books. And so like, for example, what they posted today is their new copy of Alice in Wonderland. I personally have three copies of Alice in Wonderland and do not need a fourth. I mean, let's be honest, I didn't need the second one, um, but, or the first one, there's a library, I guess, but I just love their account. Like it's just, it's just so well done. For example, this is a, this is the Steinbeck, the Long Valley, and like the picture just matches perfectly. So they've really stepped up their Instagram game as of late. So I love that one. And then also Juniper Books is amazing. So J-U-N-I-P-E-R Books. And they make these amazing book jackets. And I'm just like scrolling for a good example pick. And then they have a lot of the Penguin stuff too. So, you know, this is the, the Puffin Classics, of course, but they have so much cool stuff. Um, like here's a book jackets that they did for the Wizard of Oz series. And yeah, it's just, they're based out of Boulder, I believe, Boulder, Colorado. And I oh, I just love, love that account. So I hope that is helpful and fun. And uh, I personally created a bookstagram account at the beginning of last year, I think, or maybe midway through last year, because I just wanted an account where I could follow nothing but bookstagram accounts. And then I could have a bookstagram account and I wouldn't feel like I was spamming my planning community with all of the books and I wanted to get like a specific book club account. So if you haven't thought about doing a bookstagram account, I wish that I had done it years ago because when I'm in a reading slump, sometimes I'll just scroll through Instagram and I'll be re inspired to read again. So with that, let's jump into Alice. So what was your experience reading Alice through the look and Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass? I I'm sure I will not be alone when I say this was the hardest book for me to get through that I've probably ever read. And it's like 200 pages and I knew it was going to be dark. I didn't really find it that dark, but I kept hearing like it's so much darker than the movie is, but I didn't find it to be dark. I just found it really hard to follow, especially being sick this month. And then also like when I'm sick, then I'm extra busy because like I've been sick. So I, you know, had a lot going on when I was feeling good enough to, like get up and do stuff and then also like when I was sick I like couldn't really follow it and then I tried the audiobook I got both audiobooks and I couldn't follow that to save my life so <laughs> um yeah it's it's definitely if I had it if I if you haven't read it and you're watching this um just like for fun or because you might, might want to read it in the future or if you're new to the paper and glam book club I would say just take like a chapter a day because if I had started earlier I could have just done a chapter a day and it probably would have been nothing. But yeah, I struggled, but it was so fun to see like where so many of the references came from and where so many of the characters came from. I also, since I was just in bed, I watched the original Alice in Wonderland and then I watched the 2010 one and the 2016 one. And it was just so cool to see that they took all of the characters and just like weave them all together and made a completely different story, but like also stayed true to the book at the same time. And I'll stop rambling in a second, I promise. But I also just loved to kind of see where some of the like modern day references came from, like animal, vegetable, mineral. And I was like, I had no idea that was from Alice in Wonderland. And yeah, I'm really glad we read it, even though it was really challenging and uh, like most classics, a little, a little hard to get through. So I, it's hard to give it a star rating. So I am going to pass on that part. But what did you think? Well, is it Sarah's turn or Tabitha's turn now? Now I'm confused because Sarah left and came back. Sarah, I guess I'm going to give it to you and we'll go back to our regularly scheduled order. <laughs> um, I also like, I had the hardest time and I totally took your tip from last month and I was reading the Scarlett Johansson, well, listening to the Scarlett Johansson version and I could not for the life of me. And so then I downloaded it 
and yeah, I mean, for a kid's book, I'm just surprised because I just kept telling myself this is a kid's book. It doesn't matter that it's a classic. It's a kid's book. This should be so much easier to follow. But it was too bizarre for me, I think. And I was prepared. I felt like I was prepared for the bizarre. Like I wanted it to be, you know, really like kooky and zany because the movies are, but it's different even than that. So, um, I don't feel like I also am going to bow out on the star rating. Um, but it was hard for me to follow. And, um, we, I even had to, like, I sped up the narration <laughs> to like 1.25 on the narration even because I was like, because it was just was like slow and I was having a hard time following it. Um, and I wish I'd had time, um, had planned better and had rewatched the movies because I wanted to be able to compare like immediately, but I didn't have time. So I missed out on that. Okay, so this is the same for me. I had a really hard time with it and did not enjoy it. Um, I'd never seen any of the movies or anything. And um, so going in, I was like excited because it's like, oh, this is a classic, it's a children's book. So I just thought it was going to be, you know, like something that I was going to really enjoy, but it was so all over the place. I kept going, what? what is going on? <laughs> and it was really frustrating for me. Um, I think, and I don't know if it's because I'm listening to it. So I'm listening to it and, and I'm thinking, well, would I enjoy it if I was reading it? I don't know. Um, it's like weird. I like it in theory, but I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy experiencing, experiencing it. Um, and I felt at times that um, Alice was annoying to me like like kind of like a like a little know-it-all kid <laughs> i don't know maybe it was just me but i just had a really hard time with it um and and it wasn't what i was expecting so no i i didn't enjoy it star rating i don't know i i, I didn't like it but i don't know i might revisit it i don't know it was really hard so I, it's hard to give it stars but if i had to I, i'd go with two I have, I don't know that I've ever actually seen the entire Disney version of it. Um, I know that I've watched it, but I'm not sure if I've ever sat down and watched the whole thing in one um, sitting. So I was never like a big Alice in Wonderland fan, um, <clears throat> but I didn't really know what to expect as far as reading the like original book. Um, and when I said I was reading it, for book club this month, my daughter was like, oh yeah, let's read that together because we read together every night. And so I did read her a chapter a day and I was literally reading things out loud and I had no idea what I was saying. Like, I was like, I'm not following this at all. I don't, I don't know if you are or not, you're six years old. So maybe since it's a kid's book, you are. She said that she would give it five stars as a rating, but we only did Alice in Wonderland and she wasn't really excited about um, doing through the looking glass with me. So I'm not sure, but what she said was she liked all of the magical stuff in it and that she was in like a different world. Um, that's what she liked about it. Um, I didn't follow it well enough. I don't know. Like I sort of knew what was going on and then like, it would be just like breaks in it. And I was like, wait, what is, am I supposed to understand what's going on? Or is this just, know extra fun stuff which is fine I'm just trying to follow that. Um, but I will say I went back after I read everything and started I didn't finish it but I started listening to and reading it at the same time and that I followed it a lot better um, so I would probably like it better had I done that the whole time um, but yeah I can't give it a star rating because I feel like I was confused most of the time but I felt like I also sort of enjoyed it so I don't know no star rating for me. Um, I consider myself to have a pretty good imagination with as much as we read and as much as I like fantasy and I didn't really know what was going on most of the time. And this is probably one of the few times that I'll say that I enjoyed the movies a lot more than I enjoyed the book. I mean, I'm glad we read it because I'm always happy to read classics, but I definitely wouldn't put it as one of my top five favorite books we've ever read. I'll stick to the movies. Ditto what Aiden said. I was going to say the exact same thing. Very few times there that uh, you'll like the 
the movie more than you like the book. Um, but reading this, thank goodness I had uh, the movie as a reference point. So, you know, when some key things were kind of happening, I could kind of play it back in my head to say, oh yeah, that's the part when da 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 happened in the movie and it kind of connected things for me a little bit. Otherwise, I, I don't know, I don't know what you have to be drinking to kind of connect the dots in the book because it was it was hard. It was a hard one. And like everybody else, I'm like, okay, this is a kid's book. What is wrong with me? You know, I'm not I know I'm not that well read, but surely to goodness I could keep up, but it was a tough one. Yeah, so in the comments, one of the gals, I think it was Susan Horton, said that she wondered if C.S. CS Lewis, I'm going to do that like 50 times, Lewis Carroll was on drugs because obviously it's like really zany, but it's not just zany, it's really hard to follow. And so it has been surmised that Lewis Carroll had what's called Alice in Wonderland syndrome, which was named after him in that he had so we know that he had debilitating headaches and a lot of times uh people who have de these debilitating headaches report feeling like they are shrinking in size and growing in size and they have really really dissociative dreams and so it is it's never been proven of course because you know we don't have they didn't have the same <laughs> doctors that we do and you know records weren't kept for this type of stuff so uh it's believed that he had this alice in wonderland syndrome where he you know basically was having like a drug like experience but it was just because he had this really really bad migraines and kind of stuff that was going on in his brain so that's really really interesting there's been a lot of documented cases of this alice in wonderland syndrome since since lewis carroll uh you know wrote this book and is known to have had these really horrible headaches so there is no reports of him doing drugs that i'm aware of but i definitely researched that and was like okay what is the street name for what lewis carroll was on because this is crazy so i hope you find that interesting i definitely did i'm a huge history nerd and yeah i love learning all right what passages passages or scenes struck you as particularly whimsical or iconic? I think this is always my favorite question every month. So I am going to go with, and I hope I didn't take anyone's, but I'm going to go with on my page 66. Um, <laughs> and Alice, it's when it's, of course, it's the iconic tea party scene. And Alice says, um, I've seen Hatters before. She said to herself, the March, she's trying to decide whether to go to the March Hares or the Hatters. And like when Cheshire says, they're both mad. Um, and then that's like the whole, we're all mad here uh, line. And then later she says, I've only seen Hatters before. I've seen Hatters before. She said to myself, the March Hare will be much the most interesting. And perhaps as this is May, I won't be raving mad, at least not so mad as it, it won't be right. Okay. I cannot speak. Okay. The March Hare will be much the most interesting and perhaps as this is may it won't be raving mad at least not so mad as it was in march and i loved that and i hope you guys appreciated that i specifically put this book on for may because in the in the book she says that it's may and you guys know i love all things monthly and seasonal so that was my favorite line and i knew it was in there and it was still my favorite line and of course the tea party scene i think maybe everybody's favorite uh scene so that made me really happy and thanks for being with me today I'm a little well not quite myself all right um sarah did you have a favorite scene or passage or anything like that i mean obviously the tea party scene is my favorite i feel like that's gonna be everybody's but i also really liked the context of the we're all mad here just because i mean like you know, I've referenced that before in jokes, like, you know, they crazy family jokes, <laughs> like, um, so I've identified with that, but having never read the book, um, I like having context for things. So I guess I was just kind of happy to have the context for the quote that it, you know, I mean, and it's so heavily quoted from Alice, but, um, it was nice having context, but I liked the tea party best and the whole scene, just so zany and poopy. Well, I just like the idea of the um, Queen of Hearts and, you know, of course, her iconic off with her heads, you know, just wanting to behead everybody. That's so weird. And the idea of the the characters, um, so many of them are so, I don't know, so it's like, how would you even think of, like, to think of, like, all these different animals and, and, and like, set of cards and every, you know, all these... I mean, really, the imagination <laughs> is really deep if you're going that deep into like like 
the Cheshire cat and all, like, I just like the imagery it was very powerful imagery. Um, but I would say that I, I do like the idea of the, of the queen, um, that, that, that imagery just stood out to me. Um, so I would say that that's my favorite. Mine is, um, in the chapter, who stole the tarts? Um, <clears throat> It says, uh, this is when the Mad Hatter was supposed to be giving his testimony or whatever. I think that's what was happening. Um, and the king says, uh, give your evidence and don't be nervous or I'll have you executed on the spot. This did not seem to encourage the witness at all. He kept shifting from one foot to the other, looking uneasily at the queen. And in his confusion, he bit a large piece out of his teacup and said the bread and butter. And this was like the one part that as I was reading it with my daughter, we were both like, she kind of looked at me and she was like, wait, what? And um, I was like, yeah, he had them both in his hand, but he went to the wrong side and he took a bite out of his teacup. And she was like, what? Um, I, I just enjoyed because, you know, it was, we were both engaged in the story at that point. And um, so it was a memorable scene. We even still have been talking about it. Um, when she's like eating sandwiches and stuff, she'll talk about um, taking a bite out of her cup instead of her sandwich or whatever. I just have an iconic character, which my favorite happens to be the Cheshire Cat, of course, because he is very zany and sarcastic and mystical and magical. And of course, he's a cat, so he's my favorite and he's purple. So you don't get much better than that. I like to think of myself as a human version of the Cheshire Cat. Um, I like the um, the scene uh, that speaks to the queen's croquette ground. Um, I love the cards painting the roses red. Um, I also love the um, the croquet game uh, where uh, you know the flamingos they get straightened out and then they aim for the ball. So the queen always gets it, and then when she doesn't get it, you know the the little groundhog or balls like roll in um uh that's really cute and uh, i thought that that was great imagery and i was able to keep up with that part so it was cute awesome so i read a lot of the commentary for alice in wonderland and one of the things that it kept bringing up was the fact that lewis carroll wanted to mirror kind of the experience of growing up and how just awkward it is with the like changing of size so the question I came up with is how does the theme, uh, <clears throat> the theme of like growing up and uh, kind of coming out of adolescence uh, mirror the experience? Oh my God, I like literally cannot speak today, you guys. I'm so sorry. Okay, so in the book, she grows up and down 12 different times and that whole, each scene was supposed to mirror or mimic a different part of growing up. So there was a point in the book where she felt like she um, like didn't know who she was. She's like, maybe I'm this girl who like doesn't, you know, doesn't know much, or maybe I'm this person. And she was trying to figure out if she was still herself, like several times in the book. And there's a bunch of other examples as well. But I thought that that'd be kind of cool to talk about a little bit, just as far as how well Lewis Carol weaved all of that in and if there was other things that we missed maybe I feel like I always miss things when I come to book club and I'm like oh duh like um one of the commentaries said that trying to get into the the garden like the little small garden was basically like trying to get back into her mother's womb I thought that was like a little bit extreme and I don't know it's always like I wish Jane was here our, our English professor it's like how much of this stuff is actually like written into the book and how much of what's in here is like critics just like endowing extra meaning into these like 18th century works. I don't know. I always wonder, but I thought it'd be cool to kind of talk about that. Do you, do you have any thoughts on kind of the story and how it might mirror uh, adolescence and the feeling of growing up, Miss Sarah? Um, I think, yeah. I mean, and even like kind of into adulthood, like, I feel like you kind of have those moments where you're like, yes, I'm such an adult. I have things so handled. And then, you know, like a week later, you're like, nope, just kidding. I need my mom or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that, that constant ebb and flow of feeling like you got it. And, um, 
like realizing maybe you don't. I don't know. I think that kind of made me think about that. And I, I feel like it kind of mirrors um, just growing up in general. And I mean, even if you think about it as a kid, I mean, um, I have a 12 year old, you know, and they we're getting to the point where he thinks he's the smartest in the house and you know that's gonna last for a while and then you know I mean and that mirrors like me growing up as well like I definitely thought I was smarter than my parents at some point and then realized like oh just kidding I don't know anything I don't know how to be an adult um you know and then you go back to realizing your parents actually do have it together I don't know so I just I think that does make sense I don't I didn't pick up on it until I wrote the question um but I think it doesn't it make sense for sure. I'm happy that you included this question because um, I think like if I had thought about that while I was um, experiencing the book, maybe I would have thought a little more about it because I, I like that idea and the concept of yeah, why she go you know, why does she keep changing sizes? Um, I can see how that could possibly be um, weaved into maybe some of some of the times when she is um, a little bit, you know, mothering to some of the characters and then sometimes maybe being a little bossy, but then sometimes she's not sure of herself. So that would make sense. I like that idea. Um, and, and, and of course, it, because it's a children's book that that is interesting. I like how you can experience something and then you know, it can create a discussion about something else, which I think is, you know, the key to maybe that, you know, why it's definitely a classic and that so many people can have all these different ideas um, and experiences with it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that's the part that I really enjoy about book club, because I would have never thought about that. It was just in my in my head and experience. And I was just like, what is going on? I don't understand any of this. Um, but being able to um, get a little bit more research or hear another person's point of view. I love that because then now I'm thinking, I'm like, huh, well, maybe, maybe I can think about that. Or maybe, maybe I will reread re this maybe with my kids. Um, so yeah, I'm happy that you included that question, but yeah, I can, I can see that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I could basically echo everything that Sarah said, because that was my, those are my thoughts when um, we got the questions today. Um, but I did think while Lisa Marie was talking about, you know, how she was like, oh, am I this girl or this girl or maybe I'm this. Um, it reminded me of, you know, how like kids and even adults still to some extent um, are still kind of trying on identities and trying to figure out like, um, am I this type of person or I'm this type of person and like, um, figuring that out and I have a kid my oldest kid is about to go into middle school and you can still like you can see how he's like kind of trying on different things and like some days he's like oh yeah I'm I'm a I'm a teenager and then other days he's like no you're still such a little kid and I mean my husband and I talk about that all the time because he's a middle school teacher so he gets it every day um just like the ups and downs and stuff of adolescence and even into like adulthood still you get that like knowing everything and then not knowing anything at all i'm gonna totally interrupt because that has been my experience like just today and i love what you said sarah like earlier today i was feeling like yes i'm back i'm like in the in the groove of things because i feel like i've just been down the rabbit hole for the last couple of weeks, just being sick. And I've just in general had a hard time staying healthy this year, which has been really weird because I typically never get sick. And then this year, like I had the flu that took me down for three weeks. You guys might remember when I completely missed book club, like in February, which is so not like me. And I was thinking about this, like just preparing for book club today. I mean, I feel like there's like today I was like everything's so handled and then about two hours ago it's like I started fading and I started not really feeling well again and uh, I feel like my voice is all weird and it just was reminding me of you know our voices don't change as women but like you know it's just I, I just feel like the most awkward version of myself um, and that has kind of been that was such a theme, I guess, in, in Alice in Wonderland. It was almost like kind of appropriate, but it's kind of reassuring to hear that I'm not the only one who at like 
10 a.m. is like, oh, I have things so handled, like, oh my gosh, check, check, check. And then like in the afternoon, you're like, who am I? What am I doing? Where am I? So yeah, I appreciated that commentary, uh, Erica and Sarah. <laughs> I agree with all of y'all, and to piggyback onto that, I think Wonderland was a good place for Alice to experience the wide range of emotions and hormones you go through as you're growing up and down in life in a safe place where she maybe didn't feel so judged like she would in her real life because it was so hard with her siblings and her parents. I don't know if y'all remember, but Disney Channel used to have a show called um, Adventures in Wonderland, and Alice was a preteen in that show, and that's actually how they showed. She would go through the mirror when she was going through hard times and go to Wonderland to all her friends and learn life lessons and kind of figure everything out in a safe space, and that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, that's great, Hayden, and to piggyback on that a little bit, and answering the question number three, number three, and segueing a little bit into question number four, um, the some of the themes in the book. I think the major theme is like, obviously, her finding herself, uh, and also I think um, it's about conflicts because um, if you kind of take it one step further, you can see that she's going through like physical conflicts and emotional conflicts and moral conflicts and intellectual conflicts. So. It can, you know, when you drill it down a little bit, there's, um, I think, a lot of rel relatable things that she goes through, if that makes sense. No, that totally makes sense. I think the other thing that I, I think what I found most relatable about Alice's experience is how often she was humbled. Because I, I think that, like, learning humility is what I'm constantly learning. Uh, you know, I just want to be Supergirl. And there's times in the day when I feel like I am. And, and, you know, in the book, Alice is like, oh, I totally know how this works. And, you know, like in the court scene, for example, she's like, oh, that's the jury. And that's the judge. And she's like, oh, yeah, I got this. I, I know exactly what's going on here, finally. And then, like, it doesn't work at all how she thought it worked. And I feel like, especially with like running a business and just like life, you know, this stuff doesn't come with a handbook, you know, where it's like somebody's telling you how to do all this stuff and like how everything works. And there's just so many times in the book, she's like, oh yeah, this should work like this. And then it, it doesn't work like that at all. And like, she just keeps being humbled over and over and over again. And I feel like if there was ever a theme that like runs through the course of our lives, just as part of the human experience, it's like growing up and just like continuing, continuing to be humbled <laughs> and like thinking we know who we are and like we have things unlock and then just continuing to be humbled again. So anyway, I appreciated that about the book. <clears throat> Let's see if my voice holds up for this next one. What other themes caught your attention throughout the book? And here's a few of them. So communication breakdown is another one. Also identity, like we kind of talked about in uh, the last question. And then rules versus good behavior, like following the rules and like minding, you know, your manners and like what's good behavior. Also self-reliance. And then lastly, Victorian society. So Lewis Carroll wrote this book as a critique of and kind of a parody of uh, Victorian society. So I thought that was really interesting. And it was good to know going into the book, because I read that in like one of the commentaries going into it, that the whole book was a critique of Victorian society. So I thought that was really cool. And like an interesting thing, I wanted to make sure that we talked about it. If you guys are kind of done discussing themes, that's totally cool. But um, I definitely wanted to just chat a little bit about that. Did you have any further thoughts on themes, Sarah? You know, I didn't. I I think I say this every time <laughs> you read something that's really substantive. I I don't think I'm that sophisticated of a reader. I like things totally go over my head until they're mentioned in book club. And I'm like, oh yeah, I totally get that. Um, but I nope didn't pick up on like any of those things while I was reading it. I just I don't I don't know. I just I didn't. <laughs> Well, the same for me. I didn't. I was too busy trying to figure out what was going on. <laughs> like, where is she now again? Like, so, um, like, I felt like I didn't have an opportunity to kind of pick up on any of the themes because it was just all over the place for me. Um, but like I said, I, I like that, you know, some of those things have been brought up because then it makes you go, hmm, well, I wonder. Definitely going to I do believe that I will read this because that is a different experience from listening to listening to it, but I'm going to read it. Um, 
and you know, of course, I, I want my kids to have exposure um, to all different types of books. So I, I'll have to give it a, give it another go and see if my star rating changes. <laughs> Okay, hopefully I'm not cutting everybody off. I think everybody passed, but let me know if I if I'm messed up. So I love what you said, Tabitha, about exposure because I think that is so critical in just education of children. And when I think about the way that my mom raised me, she just intentionally exposed me to all these different things that she had no idea how they were gonna become useful in my life, but she just intentionally would expose me to just like all this random stuff that has served me so well and like she never could have known like that it would but she just intentionally kept exposing me to things and one of the reasons I think the classics are so important and why I make sure even though they're going to be challenging and they're not going to be as popular as you know like some of the big big release books with like a ton of promotion I make sure that to include them because you know it's so important to have that exposure to the classics because you find out you know how so many things in popular culture came to be and even like going to Disneyland and riding the Alice in Wonderland ride for example would be such a different experience after reading the book at least for me and yeah I, I just love having that exposure I mean I remember Vanity Fair I think was the first classic that we read which just was so tough but I'm so glad that I read it it's just like there's so many references to Vanity Fair that I that I catch myself noticing that I would never have noticed before so anyway um I just, I just love that. Oh, and sidebar, I know a lot of you listen to uh, the What Should I Read Next podcast. And I think two weeks ago, there was a gal who was who lived in Bath, England. And I was thinking about, of course, Jane Austen lived there. And they talked a lot about that. But they didn't talk about Far From the Madding Crowd was a big section of it was in Bath. And I just thought about how we read Far From the Madding Crowd uh, the year the movie came out. And I just love that because I feel like Bath features even more prominently in that book than in uh, the Jane Austen book. Or maybe I just don't remember it very well. But anyway, I thought that was really cool. And it was reminding me, listening to that podcast episode was reminding me of when we read that book. All right, you guys are probably tired of hearing my crazy voice. So um, on to number five, which is wordplay is a prominent theme and literary device in the book. And I know we kind of talked about quotes so we don't have to talk about quotes again, but I felt like because there was so many poems and so much wordplay in the book, and that was literally like half the book was poem and poems and wordplay, I thought that it'd be a little bit uh, remiss of me if I didn't if I didn't talk about wordplay at all. So, book chatters, do you have any thoughts on this one? All right, I have a favorite quote. I was going to wait, so I'll go first. Mine, of course, is from the Cheshire Cat. Alice asked the Cheshire Cat, who was sitting in a tree, what road do I take? The cat asked, where do you want Where do you want to go? I don't know, Alice answered. Then the cat said, it doesn't really matter, does it? And uh, that's kind of been the theme of my adulthood from my 20s to my 30s, because I look at all these roads that society says you're supposed to take, much like Alice, and I don't know where I want to go, so I guess it doesn't really matter which road I pick. Eventually, I'll get to where I'm supposed to be. Love it, Hayden. The only thing I have to contribute to this is I find myself using the word curiouser and curiouser more and more often. That was such a cute quote. I definitely loved that one. Uh, since we're like burning through these questions really quickly, I, I will, I pulled out some of the themes from the book and kind of how it was a commentary on Victorian society. So um, I'll just read a few. So, um, and I am, I did not come up with this. Uh, this stuff went over my head, but I thought you might think it's interesting since we're doing so good on time. All right, so Wonderland completely reverses the convention of the above ground world. So inanimate objects rule the land and they use living creatures as tools. The Duchess tries to find a moral in everything in the same way that Alice tries to understand her environment in terms of uh, cause and effect. So you guys remember when like she met the Duchess and the Duchess was like, the moral of this is this and the moral of this is this and the moral of this is this. And that was kind of prevalent in Victorian society. So she says the Duchess remarks that everything's got a moral if only you can find it. Her statement resonates with Alice's understanding that everything she encounters should result in a lesson of some kind. Her, excuse me, Alice fails to recognize that her preoccupation with rules resembles the Duchess's preoccupation with morals. Her inability to see this parallel shows that she has not reached a level of self-awareness that will allow her to understand the power that she is capable 
of wielding over Wonderland. Carol uses the character of the Duchess to condemn the self-righteous moralizing of Victorian England. And then it's also thought like the whole courtroom scene was uh, like Lewis just making fun of like the legal system and how it makes no sense. And like you can like do everything right and you're still guilty. And I've had unfortunately several experiences in the legal realm. Um, I went through my first lawsuit when I was 21 and like, it just makes no sense. It's like basically who can just, like spend the most money and yeah, it's just, it's crazy. So I really appreciated that scene because, I mean, our legal system is a hot mess. So just like it was in Victorian England. So anywho, I just love that. And then also as far as the growing up uh, scenes, uh, it's so some of the most interesting stuff was Alice cannot enter the garden even though she, want to, uh, she wants to and her desire to enter the garden represents feelings of nostalgia and growing up. And the helplessness uh, that she feels comes from her exaggeratedly small size, which also represents like how we can feel insignificant in childhood and how, you know, like adults run the world and like everything we want to do, like your parents say like, when you're older, you know, but, but you want to do stuff now. And um, the growth spurt that is caused by the cake in chapter two represents uh, like awkward bodily transformations that uh, we all experience growing up. And Alice's growth allows her like a means to fulfill her destiny, but it it also means like she grows away from the pleasures of childhood too. So that's kind of like a theme throughout the book that I thought was interesting. And um, the charms of the garden are always just out of reach and it is always more beautiful when it's inaccessible. And I think that is so true of childhood, right? Like I personally love being a grown up more than I love being a child, but there's like definitely things that I look back on and I feel a lot of nostalgia about, even if I don't want to go back to that time. So I thought that was cool. And then um, the garden occupies a central role, uh, not only in Alice's quest, but also in Wonderland. Allison, Alice becomes confused about her identity as she changes sizes, mirroring the confusion that occurs during the transition, yeah, from childhood to adulthood. And then she questions her identity. So we talked about that. So those are some of the like things that I pulled out that I thought were really cool and went right over my head. So lastly, and probably the most interesting question, at least I think, is why do you guys think Alice in Wonderland has held such an iconic place in popular culture for years and years? And I personally thought like, oh, it was Disney, you know, Disney made. This was, I believe Disney is the second Disney movie. The first was Snow White. And then I think they did Alice in Wonderland. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but excuse me, I thought that it was Disney who made this like magical world come to life in just an incredibly iconic way. But actually there were nine film versions of Alice in Wonderland before the 1951 Disney version. And like silent films and like film was just kind of coming into being in like the twenties, you know, generously. There was like silent films before that, I think even the thirties. So like that would mean within 20 years ish, there was already nine film versions of Alice in Wonderland before Disney's version. So like clearly this has been something that's stuck around like from Victorian times, which I think is just so interesting. And I don't know if it's because the characters just really stick with you more than like we realize and you like find yourself thinking about the characters that I don't know, um, but I would just love to hear your guys' thoughts about it. And then lastly, like the 2010 uh, Alice in Wonderland with like Johnny Depp, that grossed a billion dollars, which is crazy. Like most movies, like a good movie would be like 15 million, like box office is like a success if they made it for less than that. But I mean, a billion dollars on one movie, that's like, that's just crazy. That's like Star Wars. Uh, and probably maybe not even Star Wars. So I don't know what the Star Wars numbers are, but I know they're big. So anyway, do you guys have any thoughts on like why this is just so, so prevalent in our culture? I think it's the <clears throat> the visual aspect. It's so visually appealing. Uh, you know, I mean, when it's put to screen, I think, I mean, for me, I think that's why, um, I mean, I was so excited to read this because I, lo I love the visuals of Alice in Wonderland. Um, and I mean, there's so many things, you know, I mean, like you said earlier about jumping down the rabbit hole, like, I mean, I, there are so many things that are so like just sayings and things from this book that are so embedded culturally. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I just think it's so endure, endu enduring <laughs> that wouldn't come out. Um, and again, I mean, I just, the visuals, like think about 
you know, Johnny Depp as like his whole entire look as the Mad Hatter. Um, and Alice even had like how like plain she is in comparison to Wonderland. It's such a stark visual contrast. Um, I mean, at least for me, that's why I absolutely love it is I find it very visually stimulating. Well, I would say that um, it's absolutely, you know, it's either scary or genius, you know, the idea, um, the ideas, the characters, um, just thinking, I mean, it's almost as if the, um, the author was able to be in a child's mind because I, I think about some of the wacky stuff my kids say <laughs> and can just imagine like, like, um, as an adult, for the, for the be able the author to be able to write this way was so so visually and so creative and just so like off the wall. That's so why some people are thinking, oh yeah, was this person on drugs? What was going on? Because it's so like how can you even like this is like art and imagination like at its peak. <laughs> and um, I think that's probably why it's it's so it's so iconic, which is why I was happy that we um, that it was on our list this year because like I said, I'd never. I'd heard of the book and everything, but I'd never seen the movies or or read the book. But um, now I'm understanding a little more. I, I kind of wish that we had had this discussion before <laughs> before I actually um, listened to the book, because I think maybe I would have um, given it a little more time um, and maybe was looking would have been listening or looking for some things as I was experiencing it. But um, yeah, it's so much there. Um, so I think that's why it's been able to stick around for so long. And I liked, do you like the idea of it? I think a lot of us like the idea of it and it's just the execution, like the, the actual writing we get. Like, um, <clears throat> so it's like, we like the idea of this like wonderland where all these, it was just the actual, reading of it was a little bit difficult so I think it almost works better in a visual format like a movie um, because you don't get tripped over like what what is this poem like you can just be like oh they're just spouting off a poem and it's kind of crazy and um, but that's how Wonderland is when you're reading it you're like what's this poem is like what's the meaning of it and all that stuff um, I think yeah I I think everybody fantasy of of going and meeting all these crazy characters. And I think that's part of the appeal that um, has like, kept it alive for so long after it was written and fresh in people's minds. I passed on this question. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dean. But I think you're totally right. So Sarah corrected me, Sarah Piper, in the comments, and she said Alice in Wonderland was the eighth full-length animated movie released in 1951. So it was the eighth Disney movie. I did not know that. I'm not sure what was in between Snow White. Oh, she just told me. So it was Snow White, Pinocchio, Dumbo, Bambi, Make Music, Mine, Ichabod and Toad, Cinderella, then Alice. Okay, so I was wrong. Thank you guys for correcting me in real time. I so appreciate it, and I appreciate learning along with you. Oh my gosh, the sun's coming in. I'm getting the, the striping. <laughs> That's all right, we're almost done. Okay, so this was such a fun chat, and I am so grateful that you guys wanted to kind of bear with Alice in Wonderland. I totally agree. It works better in a visual format, but it was just one of those things, kind of like Breakfast to Tiffany's. Remember when we read that two years ago? Where I felt like it's so short, it's under 200 pages, it's totally a classic. It's referenced left and right in popular culture. And I just feel like as a reader, I need to know what is up in Wonderland. That and like, you know how you guys, like people always say, oh, I fell down an internet rabbit hole. And you know, we say that all the time. We're like, I have a little design team of three, including myself. And sometimes, you know, we'll be like, oh my gosh, I was supposed to be working on design, but I started to look at like one thing on the internet. Cause sometimes we need to look up like, how do you draw a book? And it's like, well, it depends on the perspective, you know, are you feel drawing it like this or like this or open, you know? And then we like, we start looking at like pictures of books just to like figure out how to draw things in. But an hour later, you're like, wait, what just happened? I 
was looking at, I went online to look at one thing and I fell down a rabbit hole. So sorry, you know, and like, those are just those little references in popular culture. And I was listening to the, what should I read next podcast? And there was a girl who said her blog was called like down the rabbit hole. That was all about like these internet misadventures, uh, which is a genius idea for a, a blog. So I'm glad we got to end our belts in housekeeping news. So we kind of have two back-to-back -back challenging books, and I apologize for that. I try to space things out really well, but I thought that Alice was going to be a little easier to get through, honestly, because, like, it's a kid's book. How hard could it be, right? Um, and this is going to be a tough one in some ways. So Tabitha's read it. So, Tabitha, I'm going to let you chime in if you have any thoughts, because um, this was her recommendation. And uh, it's very dark and very graphic as i understand it so like if you read with your kids or something this would not be a good a good choice it's i mean she's the prostitute there's like gang rape scenes as i if i remember correctly it's super x-rated so um disclaimer there if that is something that you're not comfortable with you might want to skip the title this title but it is a really really powerful book and it's from what i understand really well done and kind of a contemporary classic so this is going in our classic bucket as well as just something that I have heard over and over that every woman should read it. And I'm really excited to read it along with you guys. So Tabitha, do you have anything to add to that little promo for Miss Cupcake Brown? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, it definitely has, yeah, like you, you, you gave a good um, warning because I did not have a warning when I read it. I read it at the traditional book club <laughs> and I was like, what? What am I? What am I? What am I reading? Um, but it was worth it because of the end. So, if you're interested in a true story, um, and if you think you can kind of like flip through some of the more graphic parts, I'd say give it a go. All right, cool. So I will see you guys the last. Oh, before I go, I have like ADD. Look at the candle I've been burning this whole book chat. I wanted to show you in the beginning, but I forgot. So I will say I don't recommend it because it keeps going out. I've lit it like a hundred times and I wanted to use it in pictures, but it totally doesn't light, which is such a bummer. But I thought that I got it as a Christmas gift because one of my best friends who I grew up with knew we were reading Alice in Wonderland. And I was so excited that she got it for me. And I love the smell. It just like keeps going out. So I... If you run out and buy it, um, that's a disclaimer. <laughs> but I thought you guys would appreciate uh, that I'm, I'm smelling and burning. Well, I'm not smelling it because I can't smell. But I am burning a Mad Hat or Deep RD candle. All right. Also, so we had a Memorial Day sale, sort of. And I didn't have a chance to get a video up. Well, actually, I couldn't get a video up. And then I was like, I'll just power through. But then I didn't have the energy to like go ahead and sound shipping. So we have a sale that started um, last Friday and it is continuing until I can manage to get a video up. But what's really exciting is our book club stickers are on sale. So I wanted to point out the book club things that are on sale. Um, one is all of our titles. We have stickers for all of them. So you can grab your book club excuse me, stickers, 50% off. That's really fun. And then also Glam Reads is on sale. So the Glam Reads 365, so the full set of Glam Reading stickers is on sale. And then also the winter and spring version. So if you want to stack up on your reading, if you have a reading stickers, if you have a reading journal, or you would like to start one, or if you're new to Paper and Glam and you are planning along, these are on sale. These are kind of our cult classics. They're one of their best selling core glam stickers. So our core glam stickers are like our functional stickers. So we've got like a gym set and an office set. And this is our reading set. And it's by far the best seller on the core glam, probably because so many of us are readers in this group. Uh, that's kind of the core value of the paper and glam lifestyle. And I know it's a core value for all of you watching this. So wanted to give those a little plug and shop the sale. There's tons of other stuff on sale, but I didn't want to take too much of your time. And this is not the planning channel. So there's that. All right, and then I will see you the last Thursday of the month, which let me get you a date because I'm glad I got you a date last time because I misspoke. All right, it is June 28th. So I will see you June 28th. Thank you so much for spending an evening with us. And if you guys think of it and you have a reading friend, I would love it if you invited a friend to join us. Um, this is, I'm sure you would agree, a really fun community and I want to do a better job of getting the word out about it. So with that, to all a good night. See you next month.